Thank you, Dan. It's my pleasure to have Tess Eggerwell here to give this webcast for, for us today. Tess Eggerwell is the Winthrop E. Stone Distinguished Professor in the School of Chemical Engineering at Purdue University. Um, but prior to joining Purdue in 2004, he worked for much of his career at Air Products, and where he was an Air Products Fellow. His research is related to energy issues, um, and particularly energy systems analysis, including aspects from solar cells, biomass, and liquid fuel conversion. Professor Agrawal has been a member of AIPHE's Board of Directors and its Energy Commission, and he's also a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a foreign fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Like, uh, and hi, everybody. Like, so before I start the talk, I would just like to say that uh, I have a tendency to talk a little faster. So if that were to happen, like, you know, maybe you can send uh, through chat message to to Dan, and he can let me know, and then, then I'll be glad to slow down because, uh, you know, sitting here alone in front of a tube talking, I could go very fast, okay, because I have no guidance to to see how fast or how slow it is. So, so feel free to interrupt in that case. And with that, like, uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, what I will do is I will give you just a glimpse as we go through about the work which uh, my students have been doing on uh, on what I call synthesis process synthesis work for sustainable energy future. So let's go to the first slide. And uh, what we find is that uh, when we look at the human population over the years, what we find is till somewhere around, you know, like, you know, mid 1700s, like the human population has been fairly steady actually, less than a billion people on Earth. And, uh, but then something happened in 1769 and, uh, and the human population has never been the same again, okay? It has been on a, Remarkable rise, and and of course that event in 1769, which changed most of it, was the James Watt's steam engine. Like uh, he he invented his steam engine, and uh, and then the first use of the steam engine was to was to pump water out of the coal mines, and uh, so that more coal could be taken out of the mines. And uh, what basically that did was that for Human race, it has it had an had a much easier access to now coal, and uh, and it changed us forever. Okay, and uh, because of uh, because of coal and steam engines came the second law of thermodynamics, which is what Carnot tried to explain the efficiencies of the steam engines, and and the whole field of thermodynamics just came out of the of the use of the fossil fuels. So fossil fuels have played a vital role in the in the human existence, and as you can see from this slide here, like you know, if you look at the box, the population has been on a rise, and uh, and what you find is that the fossil fuels have been playing a very important role for us because uh, you know almost everything we do, from energy to chemicals, everything is based on fossil resources. And however, the question for us remains, I think, is going forward, like you know, the rate at which we use fossil resources is much faster than the rate at which the fossil fuel is formed in, in under the ground. So the question is, you know, how long the fossil resources are going to last, right? And, uh, and of course, I asked my guest student who just uh, graduated to draw this box, and I asked him to draw this box up to 2100 because I was guessing that uh, probably by 2100 the fossil resources will, will be not as abundant, but he's young and he's more optimistic, so he drew it at 2200, year 2200. But that's your take, okay? Whatever you think, okay? But there will be a time when, uh, when the, in the human civilization, that uh, that these fossil resources will be not as abundant, okay? And so the question is that uh, we must have, we have to develop alternative strategies, okay? So that when the fossil resources are not that plentiful, like what happens to the human race here? Because if you extend this axis all the way to the future, what you can clearly see is that. This period of roughly like 250 to 300 years, okay, like or maybe 350 years, will be just a small delta function in the in the human civilization. So, so there's a lot which will happen here onwards, and uh, but we need to come up with the solutions now, okay. And uh, and the reason we need to come up with the solutions now is because 
as you very well know, like any new technology takes, like of this level, takes 50 to 70 years before it can be totally implemented. And that was true for, for electricity. For example, it took America like close to 50, 60 years to for elect, complete electrification. And the same thing about highways, same thing about cars and so forth. So it takes a long time because we're talking of a very different scale. So it is very essential that we, we start finding the solutions now. And so what are the alternative strategies? So one of the things could very well be the solar economy period. The period going here, you could call it a renewal period or you could call it a solar economy period, but the question is, that somewhere in the human civilization we will need to make make the switch. Okay, so it may not happen in my lifetime, but certainly like uh, the transition will begin to take place. Okay, in spite of all the findings of the resources and so forth. So the question is, is so that's what I will be concentrating on this talk as to you know how you know what could a solar economy be and how do we make transitions and uh, and what are the solu possible plausible solutions actually. So why solar energy? Well. The solar energy, because uh, solar energy, as you can see from this slide, it's uh, on the Earth in one hour. We have around 4.3 into 10 power 20 joules, and, and the primary energy consumption of the world is only 5.1 10 power 20, 20 joules. So, a little bit more, more than an hour, right? The Earth gets enough energy from sun that uh, that's what we need, uh, you know, to use in a year. So, so what we are saying is an annual need could be met by just literally, you know, something close to an hour, and so. So needless to say, there's enough solar energy, but uh, the challenge in front of us is how we go ahead and uh, and harness it and use it, right? So there's challenges, of course, otherwise we all will be using it by now. So let's go ahead and look at some of the challenges, okay, and then how we we could overcome them is the question. So, so one of the biggest challenges of the solar economy would be is because uh, the solar photons, as they come, and uh, and fossil fuels, First they got converted to wood or animals or whatever, then they got buried in the ground and it took millions of years to be made and harness them. But uh, in a solar economy, that luxury will not be there. Like, you know, we will have to learn to harness solar photons at the same time scale as we want to use them. So it has to be on the time scale of, of minutes to hours to a few days. So we must harness it, we must use it. And then, then obviously after using the energy, we release it back to the Space, right? So, because for example, when I drive in the morning my car to Purdue and uh, and I park my car in the garage and then I go back home and then again I park my car in the in the garage at home. Then uh, then the car is at the same place and I'm in my living room. So so the question is that 0.2 gallons of gasoline which which was in my car, what happened to that? Okay, and basically what happened to that was that 0.2 gallons of gasoline went in outer space, right? So I converted it to heat and uh, planet Earth radiated it back to the outer space. So that's what happens to almost, have, I would say, all the solar energy which comes on the Earth, like majority of it is, uh, is Earth absorbs it and immediately releases it to the outer space. So very little of it gets accumulated on the Earth's surface and uh, some of it is, uh, is accumulated as clouds and and plants and so forth, but then uh, clouds rain and that latent heat is back in the outer space and uh, and and the wood when we chop and we burn and that energy is again back in the outer space. So, so the bottom line is that from the first law we know that whatever energy comes goes back out and Earth is like a closed box in that sense and so we must learn how to take it and use it and then release it back. So it is more of, of taking energy and learning how to harness and manipulate it on the time scale with, on which we want to use it. So, so, so the question is, if you want to harness the solar energy and uh, we want to deal with it, then just like every chemical engineering question, the first question is, how dense is this thing? Like, you know, what, what uh, to try to get some feel for the solar energy. So the next few slides are basically towards making up, making us a little bit more friendly with what solar energy is. Okay. So how dense is the solar energy? So, for example, like most of us fill gasoline in our cars, and uh, when you're filling the the gasoline. You know, generally the the U.S. government mandate rate is 10 gallons per minute, so you cannot find a patrol, you know, a gas station where you can fill gasoline faster than 10 gallons per minute. And how big is 10 gallons per minute? So it is around 20 megawatts of power supply. So the rate at which we are supplying energy to our car is 20 megawatts. Okay, so that's a very large number. So I don't know about you folks. But when I saw this number first time, you know, like uh, I was kind of very surprised that uh, that uh, the rate at which we fill the energy in our car is 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 
is fairly high. Okay? So just to give you an idea, like a power plant could be 400 megawatt or 500 megawatt. So, so you are, we are selling in, I would say fairly, so if it's a 400 megawatt power plant, we are selling 120. You know, like it's certainly a large fraction of uh, one fifth of that. So it's, it's pretty, pretty large. Okay. So, so, so what's the? So let's compare it with the solar energy and try to get a feel for uh, for how how this compares with uh, with the solar energy. So on the right, what I'm showing here is just the solar spectrum. Let's not worry about it. I think the thing which we need to really worry about is is the solar radiation on an average around 1,000 watts per meter square. Okay. If I wanted a 20 megawatt of power supply, then obviously I would need an area of 20,000 meters square. And uh, and uh, and how big is that area? Well, basically it's more like a four foot wall field. So, so what that is telling us that if I was collecting energy from um, from sun to to at the rate of 20 megawatts to supply to my car, and if I could collect solar energy at uh, at 100 percent efficiency, which we all know is not going to happen, but if I could then still I will need four football fields to, to collect that energy. And that's a pretty large area, by the way. And generally, if you're collecting with the typical efficiencies of around 20%, then uh, you will need even far bigger or t far bigger than this land area, which I'm showing. So what we learn from these slides, basically, the, one of the things we learn is that the, the solar energy is very dilute, okay? It is it's a very low energy density, okay? So it is very dilute, and uh, in some sense we have to thank it that it is dilute because if it was not dilute, then we would not be able to go out and we all would get burned. So, so while it is good as a human being that it is, it is dilute, but uh, from an enduring point of view, in order to collect it and in order to harness it, you know, it becomes very challenging. As we all know, like from our chemical engineering principles, handling dilute streams and purifying it and separating it and all those is very energy intensive process and expensive process, very cost expensive process. So, so that's the first challenge and first observation we make about the solar energy. The next, next observation we make about the solar energy is its intermittency, right? So, so where I am today, like in West Lafayette, like uh, it's cloudy right now outside and it is raining. So, obviously there is uh, very little of sunlight outside, which uh, one could uh, capture, and and of course the geographic uh, variability, which is what I'm showing on the right side. So the area in the U.S. where there is a lot of solar energy is like, you know, the Arizona and so forth, which is on the left, uh, you know, southwest of the uh, of the United States. So it depends where you are located and uh, whether you have enough solar energy or not. So there's a lot of geographic variability and there is an intermittency issue. So what that brings us to, to the next point, that uh, we must learn to how to store energy, okay? And, uh, and it is storage is needed at all the levels. So we have to be able to store the energy for, you know, as small as uses as lighting a room to the energy used at kilowatt levels inside a house, okay? And of course, I, we just talked about the megawatts for transportation and of course the power plants on the right which could supply like, you know, like uh, hundreds of megawatts and gigawatts to the, to the grid and to everyone. So, so the storage is a challenge and, uh, and but nevertheless uh, must be met, okay? And, uh, the third, third point to observe is that the, when we talk about as chemical engineers, when we talk about the energy, like, you know, it's, it's pretty large, large quantity, okay? So, so the, like, for example, here, what, what I'm showing is, showing is that the primary energy use was at 15 terawatts, and primary energy is basically the energy which has not gone through the transformation, like coal, coal, oil, natural gas, wind, and so forth, okay? So there was 14.8 terawatts. And but by 2050 it could be 28 terawatts, so it could double. Okay, and and also to keep in mind is that the when we talk about energy and the chemicals, even the largest chemical like sulfuric acid is only a small fraction of uh, and a very tiny fraction of what oil is. So so the use of energy literally dwarfs the the volume at which the chemicals are produced or the way the chemicals are used. So so energy is is uh, is very large and the large scale. Is uh, and so if you, when we talk about the large scale, such magnitude, it's very important that technology, we, whatever we come up with, is cost effective, right? Because uh, we will be covering large land areas to harness it, and uh, and by just sheer large area, we, it cannot be expensive. In the very basic infrastructure of putting the foundation or doing whatever you're doing over the large area, must must be low. Okay. So an example which I tried to show here is what you what you see here. Is the is the price of the solar cells? So when I came to Purdue, as Martha told you earlier, you know, like the the price of the solar cells used to be somewhere between eight to nine 
dollars per peak watt. Okay, so and it's a DC means it's a direct current and it's a per peak watt, which is right here. Okay, but in the last eight nine years, the prices have come down quite a bit. Okay, and uh, now they are are as this slide shows, they're close to four dollars a a peak watt, peak watt. So it has come nearly half, but still it is fairly high. And and guess what? Out of these four dollars, roughly two and a half dollars is just the installations and the peripheral costs. Okay. The solar module itself is not close to a dollar a peak watt. So, so that goes back to what I was telling you earlier, that uh, when we talk about recovering dilute energy, and uh, so what happens is we need to use large areas, and if you need to use large areas, what that means is is there are costs other than what we think generally. Like, you know, so there are costs in terms of just the basic infrastructure to support to, which will be supporting the stuff which will be harnessing the solar energy. And uh, and those costs have to come down too. So so there is a very it's a very tough, challenging problem. Okay, and uh, and when you couple it with the fact that whatever you're installing is not being used 24 hours, so the return on capital is only for those six hours or so in, in 24 hours when uh, when the light is falling on it, it does become a very challenging problem. Things have to be cheap, and for that matter, like on this slide, what the numbers you see, like around four dollars a peak watt has to come down to below $2 a peak watt before we all will start putting it on our rooftops, okay? Because then at that point in time, it will be fairly cheap, okay? Like even once it is between below below $2 and when it approaches to $1, then of course, like, you know, it will be everywhere, okay? So, so, so the challenge is, but as you can see, it, as the volume of the use has increased, okay, and, and more and more bigger plants are being built, like the blue being 100 kilowatt here, okay, the cost has, a lot of learnings are involved and the cost is coming down. Okay. So the observation number, observation number four is that people normally say that things can be inefficient because solar energy is free and therefore let's go and don't worry about the efficiency. That's not correct, okay? You we need to worry about the efficiency because because of the sh just the sheer volume and the sheer land area from which we need to harness the energy to make any reasonable amount of, en of energy we need to recover. So it is very important that, uh, so, on one hand, you may not have very, very high efficiencies, but you cannot, by the same token, you can't afford to have fairly low efficiencies of your processes. Whatever you do, it cannot be very low. And so so that's, a, that's another observation which I wanted to make because when we do process modeling and when we do all these things, we need to keep these points uh, in our back of our mind, actually. So what's... What's the solar economy vision? Okay, so when uh, when I came to Purdue, one of the things which I was I have since I have been involved with is is uh, with some of my graduate students is uh, like uh, just go and dream in the sense that um, you know if the if the fossil resources were were less plentiful or uh, or if uh, you know if, if for whatever reasons we decide not to use as much of fossil resources, then how do we use solar energy to to make food, chemicals, you know, supply the heats we need, the electricity we need, and also go from point A to point B, that's the transportation. So, so of course, all these things have to coexist in synergy, right? Okay. And with the food having the highest priority because uh, we all would like to eat first before we do anything else, right? So, and maybe food and then, of course, uh, for food, chemicals and food are somewhat related because, you know, making uh, fertilizers and so forth, like, you know, and from a using in a solar economy, that's gonna, going to be a challenge. And then, uh, you know, how do we meet all these needs together? Okay, so, so what I will do now is, like, show you some of the work we have done on uh, on, on this flow sheet, actually. And uh, so what I will do is I will first talk to you about, uh, about, uh, you know, sun to chemicals and and sun to wheels. So how, because the chemicals and, and transportation are somewhat related because when you're making chemicals, you could be making fuels and the fuels could be used, being used for the transportation. So so let me just touch some base. So the next, next few, few, next slides, some of the slides will be, I will be talking about, uh, you know, how about, uh, how do we go about looking at chemicals and transportation? So. So, of course, in a renewable economy where everything is happening, we need renewable carbon sources as well as hydrogen, right? Because that's why it is renewable, right? So, otherwise, so we need a carbon, renewable carbon, and the renewable carbon most likely will come from atmosphere, which is 300, where it, today its concentration is 398 parts per million. And uh, the, the key thing here is that either we go and get it from the atmosphere, which is 398 parts per million, or 
we have to use some closed cycles where we collect our CO2 and we don't discharge it to the atmosphere. So whatever the case may be, but one way to harness carbon dioxide from atmosphere is growing biomass because because biomass growing biomass basically takes that very dilute concentrations of 398 parts per million and uh, supplies us as uh, you know as dense form of carbon. And what I show here is sustainably sustainably available biomass. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that when you grow biomass, like uh, like corn or whatever we grow, like uh, after harvesting the corn kernels, we, you can go in there and, for example, you can collect one third of the plant from the land, okay, without disturbing the ecology of that land, okay, and without disturbing the carbon and the nutrients of that soil. So, so what in a sense you have is a byproduct of the existing agricultural and forestry practices whereby you can go in and collect some of the biomass. And that biomass is sustainably available waste biomass, okay? Or simply sustainably available biomass. So we can have this biomass year after year without employing any new land or doing anything different. But the only different different thing we have to do is change our agricultural and forestry practices so we can collect that. And the next is that uh, if we are not done with that carbon, which we'll get from here, then what we need to do is we need to use a different land area and we have to grow regulated fuel crops, okay, such as uh, miscanthus or uh, sorghum or whatever have you, okay, or some people like to grow algae or or there are people who also talk about uh, about taking this carbon dioxide directly from um, from atmosphere, recovering it and, and converting it to liquid fuel. So, but once you decide to do this, you are asking for the additional land area and when you're asking for additional land area, keep in mind, that there are alternate uses to which this land can be put into, for example, making electricity or, or, uh, or, di or directly making hydrogen or, or what, or making recovering heat or whatever have you. Okay, so now that use has to compete with all the uses I have listed here. Okay, so, so now let's change gears and just first concentrate on how are we going to deal with sustain so sustainably available biomass because this biomass, as I said, is available to us year after year. Okay, so if you look at that. Let's call that SA biomass as this. so. It is no that in some sense that biomass is no different than coal, or no different than natural gas, which we already have, and uh, so so it is akin to primary energy, but also it is a carbon source. Okay, so we just need to keep that in mind. This is also a carbon source for us. So, so if we take the so what happens is where we see the elements of nature here: the air, water, and solar energy, and and. Uh, Maybe we should have shown here the soil also, but the elements of nature come together, give us the SA biomass, sustainably available biomass, and then what we do is we take that biomass and we can convert it to fuel or whatever we want to by any of the processes, such as gasification, fissure troughs, fermentations, hydrothermal gasification, you know, like pyrolysis and so forth. So there are many, many processes and we can use those processes to do it. and. Uh, and uh, Nauni Singh, my guy's friend who did this, actually, he, he, he did all these processes and what he found out was that uh, in all the cases, the carbon recovery was more like around 40%. So it did not matter which process you were trying and all of them had recovery of 40%. And so, so the, whatever the carbon came with biomass, 60% of the carbon was released to the atmosphere as CO2. So that was kind of intriguing because all the processes, when you model them and you run them through, they they all have roughly the same carbon recovery. And so, so in the beginning, it was a surprise for us, okay. But uh, but nevertheless, I just want you to keep that point in mind, okay. And so, if you look, if you come back now to the next slide, and what you find is that the in US we have uh, SA biomass per, around 500 million tons per year, okay, by various estimates. It could be as high as 750 million tons a year, and. Uh, so whereas in US, the transportation fuel uses is around 12.7 million barrels per day. So if we took all this SA biomass and if we converted it to, to liquid fuel by any of the processes, which I showed you on the earlier slide, you will get somewhere between 1.6 to 2.6 million barrels per day of, uh, of oil. And uh, obviously this is far smaller than 12.7 million barrels per day. So, so the, it is very clear to us that, uh, that uh, the, at least in the US context, and the SA biomass will be insufficient, like, you know, to supply all the liquid fuel. So obviously, we want more liquid fuel, and if you wanted more liquid fuel, the question is, what are we going to do, okay? And the, what we are going to do is, it's shown on this slide, 
is because right now we are releasing that 40, that 60 percent carbon in the in the atmosphere. So the question is, if we could rather than releasing that carbon, if you could put some another form of energy and convert that carbon to liquid liquid fuel, then obviously we will have a much higher recovery, at least two and a half times of what we have now. So if you want to put another form of energy in, and how are we going to get that other form of energy in a renewable economy, right? So if you look at the solar photons as they come, and if we try to recover them as heat, we could get up to 70% of it. So of solar photons as heat. So 70% of the solar energy could be harvested as heat, okay? And by the time, if you were to go to electricity, we could harvest that, you know, with a fairly high efficiency than the, you know, you could go and buy 15% solar modules today, actually. And uh, if you took those solar photons and if you try to make hydrogen, and, and we'll talk a little bit about hydrogen a little bit later, and uh, what you can see is that you could take out hydrogen also with a fairly high recovery efficiency is like, you know, something like 45, 50% efficiency of hydrogen, okay? But if you were to grow a biomass on the same land area, like, you know, the, so basically when you you collect, majority of the biomass collected, the efficiencies are less than 1%, okay? And even 1% is very high. Between 1% to 2% is like sugar cane, which is very high efficiency crop. But other than that, the biomass efficiencies like, like are very low, okay? So what this means is if on a, on a land area, if I were to grow biomass, and uh, and at the end of the year, if, you know, if I harvested all the all the crop, and if I said how much energy that crop has, okay, and then how much sunlight fell on that on that same land area, so the so the energy contained in the crop is no more than like you know less than one percent. Okay, so of what the energy of the solar. So you can really, and by the time we we are chemical engineers, so by the time we convert it to liquid fuel, those processes are not going to be hundred percent efficient of conversion to liquid fuel, and by the time we account for that, we're talking about very low efficiency, like 0.15 to 0.2, 0 0.3%. So the question is, it is very clear by looking at this slide that uh, if you wanted more energy, like, you know, and energy was the only goal, then uh, growing biomass is probably not the, not the, not the most, uh, m most uh, you know, preferred choice, actually. So what we find is that uh, something like electricity, hydrogen, or heat is 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 more preferred than than growing biomass. Okay. So we learned something here. Observation number six is obviously so if we have a biomass like SA biomass, okay, it is primarily a carbon source. Okay, so so it is not as much energy source because if you just wanted an energy and uh, then we are better off going and recovering energy from from a given land area in different form. So the biomass is uh, is. Uh, is for all practical purposes is a very important carbon source because uh, you know if we as human beings, if uh, or as a chemical engineer rather, if we had to go and recover that carbon from the atmosphere, right? So it, I just told you earlier that it is around 398 parts per million, and uh, so even from the environmental point of view, that's a very high concentration. But uh, but from a chemical engineering point of view, if you had to recover that 398 parts per million of CO2 from the air there would be very entropically unfavored process, right? So because if you imagine, like, you know, if you could see all those million molecules buzzing by us, and uh, there were 398 molecules which are red and all other molecules were black, and we were sitting there with our tweezers and trying to catch those 398 red molecules and put them in a beaker, like, entropically, it's very unfavorable process, right? Because, you know, we're picking 398 out of a million which, are, which, which, which would be going, going by us, so separating and recovering is very, and yet that's what Mother Nature did, right? It, it went after those 398 out of million, collected it, and gave us a dense form of carbon. And, and if you use it, and uh, and if you release 60% of it back uh, from the SA biomass to the atmosphere, I think uh, that's, and then again, we are still waiting for more carbon atoms, then, then that is not the correct way to do it, okay? So, so we must preserve those carbon atoms, and of course, if you're trying to preserve that carbon atoms, the only way we are going to preserve that carbon atoms is by by putting in extra energy. And by the way, I just forgot to tell you folks that why the carbon recovery is 40% on the earlier process. The reason is very simple. Like you know, biomass has 35% uh, oxygen. Okay. So, so since the biomass has, so if you go back, sorry, let's go back just on this slide. The reason it has a 40% uh, carbon recovery is because uh, since biomass has 35% oxygen by weight, so all the carbons are partially oxidized form, right? And since they're partially oxidized form, the energy content per carbon atom in biomass 
is roughly two-thirds of what it is in gasoline, for example. So gasoline has no oxygen, right? It's all carbon hydrogen bonds. And uh, so per carbon atom, its energy content is high. And since per carbon atom, its energy content is high, so if we took 100 carbon atoms of biomass, and each carbon atom of biomass has only two-thirds energy of uh, what per carbon is in, in a high-density molecule like gasoline, and if you were converting the biomass carbon to, to gasoline-type molecules, then obviously we can't take 100 carbon atoms of biomass and get 100 carbon atoms of, uh, of gasoline because uh, we need to input more energy, otherwise we're not going to get it. And that's the reason that we, by first law, we have to, if it is two-thirds, then the one-third of the carbon must leave, right? If Even if everything was 100% efficient, and since not everything is 100% efficient, we end up rather than having two thirds of the carbon, we end up having 40% of the carbon in our processes. So it's very clear that if you wanted to recover all carbon, okay, all 100 carbon, then uh, we have to put additional energy from outside while you are upgrading the, the energy content per carbon of the biomass molecules so it can be used as fuel. Okay, so, so that with that context, we come back to this slide and uh, what we see here is now suddenly, this is a chemical engineer's, uh, I would say, dream project because uh, we have this assay biomass and now we have to come up with augmented processes which use other forms of energy, not the energy from the biomass, but other forms of energy which can be recovered with at least an order of magnitude higher efficiency. And we use those energies with the assay biomass to get our fuel here. And, uh, and I don't know about you folks, but I'm certainly limited by my own imagination because uh, Somehow I have to learn to use all these different forms of energies and with SA biomass and come up with a new process, whatever that may be, okay, which will give me high fuel. And so that would, could very well be as simple as gasification and fissure troughs and using hydrogen from, from solar energy to increase the hydrogen content and making sure that all the carbon is converted to, to via fissure. So you take a biomass, you gasify it, you add the hydrogen and you do fissure troughs and convert all the carbon molecules to fuel. Or you could uh, use fast hydroporosis followed by hydro deoxygenation, okay, and then use the hydrogen from here and convert it to liquid fuel. Or you could do a hydrothermal gasification, make methane and so forth. You could use biochemical processes using some of these energies and so forth and whatever one can come up with. But suddenly the box has opened up for us and uh, from a modeling point of view, this is absolutely a dream project suddenly because I'm free to choose whatever processes I want, and uh, and uh, and it is absolutely a wonderful, you know, modeling exercise. Okay. So one of one of the pro projects which we did model, and I just wanted to show it to you, and this is from uh, my graduate student Dharik, who just graduated. Actually, he finished his, his thesis just last week. Okay, so so basically, you take a biomass here, and uh, what he did was he said, okay, he's going to use the biomass to fast hydroporosis, okay, which makes char and which makes a crude liquid fuel, okay, or take the char along with the biomass, gasify it, send the syngas, okay, to do a syngas cleaning, fish it off, make a liquid, and you can use heat, hydrogen, electricity from the sun, any of the places you want it to. And you can model this, how the biomass should go this way or this way, or how much energy you should use. And he did that for different uh, carbon recoveries, okay, so, so basically, What's the optimum process was a question, okay? Like how do you go about doing it, okay? And uh, and he did, he wrote a model, okay, a mixed integer nonlinear programming model with uh, where he's minimizing the, his objective function is minimize the total solar energy used, okay, for a given, given quantity of biomass, okay? So the biomass quantity is given here and, uh, and he's wearing his uh, carbon recoveries, okay, and uh, and there's a whole set of equations, including mass energy balance, okay, there are split fractions, conversions, you know, inequalities, and then carbon, and he was specifying the target carbon recovery, so let's say we want 70% carbon recovery, or biomass carbon recovery, that is, okay, or 60, or 50, or 100, or 90, whatever it is, okay, and then, and these are which processes we are using, and these are the integer variables from there, and then, um, we use branch and bound search methods, and uh, with the help of Mohit Tawar Milani, he's a professor here in uh, Kennedy School of Business, a very smart man, very bright man, actually. And uh, so he's our collaborator on this, and uh, he is one of the co-authors of Baron, and he wrote that Bar first version of the Baron program during his uh, PhD thesis. So having him on campus is absolutely fabulous, and uh, 
So we have been collaborating, and uh, we wrote this uh, e this model, which has more than 10,000 equations, and, and it needs to go through and uh, come up with an optimum answer. So here is some of the answers which uh, which we got. Okay, so what you see is the solar energy on the y-axis used per kilogram of biomass. So the, let's pretend that the biomass given to us is a kilogram, so its quantity is fixed. Okay. And on the x-axis, what we are saying is the process carbon recovery, so how much carbon is being recovered from the biomass, what fraction is recovered. And if you have a standalone processes, as I told you earlier, like your recovery is around 40% around to 50%, which is what you see here. And there are two types of processes here, like the integrated process. Integrated process meaning we are using a fast hydropyrolysis as well as fischer tropsch gasifier, both. And the red ones, the, the red blocks, are basically gasifier and fischer tropsch So that's just a, there's no fast hydropyrolysis involved here at all. And what we quickly find out that the integrated process, which is the blue blue bars, okay, where we are using both the both the gasifier as well as the fast hydropyrolysis in synergy, you know, we find that the heat requirement is lower than than by standalone. A standalone gasifier and fischer tropsch process. And however, as you go hi higher and higher in carbon recovery, the need for gasifier increases actually. And, and it's no surprise that you, if you go way beyond 50% carbon recovery, we require a lot of, uh, lot of hydrogen and a lot of solar energy as a heat. And that's what this one is showing. So, so that's good. So at least uh, you can go, you know, to fairly 95 plus percent uh, carbon recoveries and. Uh, with, uh, with all this solar energy input. So it is possible to design processes which are optimal in terms of, uh, of solar energy use. And, uh, and this may be the key to building large size plants, identifying how to preserve carbon and use the, use the, as, and minimize the use of the solar energy. So, so, so basically the conclusion from there is we have consistently lowered solar, solar energy input than a single pathway, actually, synergic. So what did we learn from this? Okay, what we have learned from this is that uh, when we're doing a systems analysis for fuel or chemicals or whatever, we need to be careful that we don't work on it in isolation, like, you know, take biomass or take sugar and make ethanol or uh, make uh, make butanol or, you know, and, and try to use that as a fuel because uh, doing so would not be correct. We need to, need to come up with the processes which use heat, electricity, hydrogen, and all those things together to minimize the use of the solar energy. Remember I told you it is very dilute and, and you need a very large space to recover it. So, so that's one of the things. And the other thing which also I should let you know is by the time you come to this slide, you realize that we may have asked a wrong question. And, and the reason we may have asked a wrong question is because it is not about liquid fuels really, right? Because um, for chemicals, yes, but for liquid fuel, no, because uh, Ultimately, the problem boils down to is that we want to go from place A to B, okay? And uh, and you may not need liquid fuel for short distances. They may be plugged in hybrid electric vehicles, and electricity may be directly used there. And so when you are doing a process modeling and, and optimizing the entire system, one has to keep that in mind, that it, uh, you know, that's another dimension which one has to put in the equations and, and model it as more as, the distance driven and what kinds of distances we are driving, short distances, long distances, or whatever, like, you know, and um, and what can be made, met by electricity directly or maybe hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, what it could be met directly, and then you need a liquid fuel maybe to fly from, uh, let's say, from uh, Indiana, like Indianapolis or Chicago to New Delhi or, or wherever you are trying to go to, okay, so long distances, okay. So we need to worry about all that, okay. So. This is a multi-dimensional problem. It is not as simple as, uh, as uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fun project, that's how I would put it, okay? It is not a very simple, trivial project, okay? All right, so, so one thing probably you gathered from all this by now is that as you are going through all this modeling, that, uh, that uh, if you wanted a high carbon recovery and if you wanted to preserve everything, somewhere along the line, you need solar hydrogen, right? So, so the question is, if you're going to be needing solar hydrogen, then where are we going to get, how, are, how should we go about making solar hydrogen, right? And uh, so Dharik tried to answer that question in his thesis, okay, what's the best way to, to make, uh, to recover hydrogen from sun? And of course, uh, if you're trying to make hydrogen from sun, like you could take water and you could do a, heat it to very high temperatures using solar heat and you could split it into hydrogen and oxygen and collect hydrogen. You could have a photochemical routes, okay, which people have. You could have a, 
you could uh, convert light to electricity using any photovoltaics or solar thermals or whatever have you, and then use an electrolysis to convert it to, to hydrogen. But of course, this is a two-step process, so there is an inefficiency involved in each step. Okay, like you go from, uh, from first you produce, you take light, you make electricity from electricity, and then you go electrolyze, so it's a two-step. And whereas if you could take heat directly through a thermochemical, then it's a direct one-step process. And of course, the photochemical processes generally use uh, use some kind of a materials with some bend gaps, and uh, and the question is that then you are limited with the with the photons you are harvesting. Okay, and so what Harik did was he defined sun to hydrogen efficiency as the lower heating value of hydrogen, okay, which you will be producing about, divided by the total incident annual solar energy on the land. So so the fraction of the solar energy which is incident. What fraction of that energy shows up as the lower LHV, that's the lower heating value of hydrogen, that is the sun to hydrogen efficiency. So we define that parameter, sun to hydrogen efficiency, and now let's look at some of these processes and see what is happening, okay? So the photochemical processes, as I was telling you earlier, they, people have done a lot of work, and there are, this is a, the Bolton et al's paper is very informative on this, and whether you use a single or a double band gap photo system, your efficiency Theoretical limits could very well be between 31 to 46 percent. Okay, so at least we know that. Okay, and uh, so the question is, which? Uh, but if you are using sun to hydrogen through a thermochemical process, yeah, then uh, you can use a entire solar spectrum because then you are not limited by the band gap, which cuts off the lower energy photons. But uh, but if you are just absorbing it to get heat, you could absorb all the solar radiation. So once you can absorb all this, sorry, okay, so you can absorb all the solar radiation, you could convert it. So how could that process look like? So basically here what I'm showing is, is a black body absorber at temperature T, sun comes in, black body absorber absorbs it, some of it is irradiated back in the atmosphere, some of it is recovered as heat, So this, and you could use that heat to, to split the water. And the next other is that uh, you, you consider sunlight and you produce the heat and then heat is, uh, is used in, in, in any heat engine to produce work, okay, and uh, and this is how you be, and then this work could be electricity, and then the electricity could be used to, as I said earlier, to electrolyze or in the process for pumping and compressing and so forth, okay. So with that, here is a process which I which uh, which Dharik modeled, and so what we have modeled here is the sunlight comes, we concentrate it, and we take that sunlight and uh, and we take water, as shown here on the left, bottom near the bottom left. We take the water, we pump it to fairly reasonably high pressures, and once the water has been pumped, okay, it is heated. It is heated all the way to the reactor temperature, which is where the sun's heat is going. And uh, at the temperatures as high as, as 1800 degrees Kelvin to anywhere between 1500 to 2500 degrees Kelvin, the, the the water will split, okay, into into hydrogen and oxygen, and and you could use a membrane, okay whereby hydrogen permeable membrane where hydrogen would permeate, okay, and uh, you could collect the hydrogen, compress it and bring it back to one atmosphere, or or a membrane on the other side which is oxygen permeable, and whatever oxygen is formed could be collected and then compressed and uh, collected at one atmosphere. So you can see that the electricity is supplied by heat being converted to 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 a heat engine to a heat engine to the to, to electricity and then used to for pumps and the compressors which are needed in the process. Basically, compressors are supplying the work of separation of hydrogen and oxygen as it is formed in the high temperature reactor, okay? And the reason we use, we pump the water at high pressures is because it makes it easier to collect this hydrogen and oxygen, actually, and uh, it doesn't, takes much less energy to pump a liquid than to compress a liquid, and, and that's, the, to, sorry, to compress a gas, and that's why we pump, pump a liquid, okay? All right, so. This is the process which is model, and here's the results actually. And uh, and of course, uh, on these results, what we're showing is that our sun to hydrogen efficiency as a function of the reaction temperature, the temperature at which the reactor sits. And at the top of this figure, what you see a horizontal line, and at around 0.8, okay, and that's the 80% efficiency that is, okay. And then 80% efficiency is basically a theoretical limit, okay. So you, you process I just showed you. If you simulated that process with the delta T being zero, that's the heat transfer and the heat exchange is being zero, and the driving forces across the membranes, like the delta P's across the membranes being nearly zero, so they're all reversible processes, and, uh, and, 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 
and then what you do is you you come up with with, a, with this, uh, and all the compressors are 100% efficient, all the pumps are 100% efficient, then you get a, this close to 80% uh, percent efficiency of uh, what is shown here. And the solar concentration used here is 8,000, okay? So, so just keep that in mind. So this is the absolutely what Carnot has told us. This is the theoretical limit for making hydrogen as the solar concentration of 8,000. And uh, so for this one, it doesn't matter what process we use, right? Because they all processes will should give will and should give the same efficiency, and that's what we have observed. And as a matter of fact, there was a check, there was an internal check for our model whether you know it gives the theoretical limit or not. Because if it did not, then we would know that our thermodynamic database is not correct or something is not correct. So once we have that. Like, you know, what we find is that uh, we compare the efficiencies now, the real-life efficiencies with real delta Ts, okay, delta T minimums, and uh, and also the efficiencies of compressors and pumps and so forth. And uh, what we find is that the, that the efficiencies, like, you know, if you see for the electrolysis near room temperature, that's the bottom, which is around 10 to 20 percent, with a single junction PV making, giving us the electricity at 29 percent efficiency. That will be the state-of-the-art gallium arsenide solar cell, by the way. Okay, we could take that and we can electrolyze the water near room temperature. So the efficiency will be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. But on the other hand, like you know, if you do electrolysis at a higher temperature, as you increase the temperature, things become more efficient because the delta G it becomes your friend there. So if you're doing electrolysis at 950 degrees using a single junction solar cell, so the here what is being done is you're using a solar cell and, and the, whatever the band gap of the solar cell is, which is around 1.4 electron volts, so all the photons with higher energy than 1.4 electron volts are used to make electricity, then which is used for electrolysis. But all other photons which are not absorbed, which have the energy less than 1.4 eV, for example, is used to heat the water up to 950. So that's why you see an improvement. And these efficiencies could very well be close to 30%. But then then you use a multi-junction solar cell, you know, which is what the, the purple color is. You know, you use a multi-junction solar cell which have a very high efficiency of 38 to 45 percent, and then 44 uh, percent is the latest world record for multi-junction, like, you know, photovoltaic, okay? And if you were to use that, and then use the leftover solar photons for heating, then what you find is your efficiency could be as high as close to 40 percent. However, the solar thermal, which is what we were talking earlier, right, you know, with the membranes and just simple heat from the at least modeling results, we find that it has a potential to give us within the temperature range of 1500 to 2200 Kelvin, it is potential to give us efficiencies which are higher than any of those processes. Okay, so that, that's the power of our modeling, right? Because we can model the processes and we can see what its potentials are. And so we find that there's a large potential for our process actually. And so but the only hitch is that those membranes I should, we talked about, the hydrogen and oxygen, we don't have those membranes as of today, but it certainly tells us that there's a need to do research on that front. All right, so so what we learned from this all this morning that it is possible to get solar thermal hydrogen efficiencies, sun to hydrogen efficiencies of 35 to 50 percent is possible, and there are processes which could do that actually. So next, like you know, we're going to switch a little bit. Like you know, we talked about the the the, the, the solar energy being intermittent, and and there's a need to store it, and from place to place it varies. And we need to store it at gigawatt hour level. So let's, that's the level. Let's talk. Let us talk about it. What this slide is showing us the storage efficiency, meaning when you store the energy and by the time you use it, what fraction of the energy you end up being delivered from what you used. And as you can see, at the small scales, we have batteries which are fairly efficient, around 80, 85 percent efficiencies. But as you go to very large storage capacities, like uh, 10 gigajoules per cubic meter which is with, uh, with hydrogen and the efficiency starts to plummet. It is in the neighborhood of uh, 35, 40 percent. So there's certainly a need to, need to find solutions there, actually. And so need a high energy density and storage efficiency solutions, okay? And, uh, and now we need, so, so let's talk about storing energy at grid level, okay? And uh, so if you're talking about energy at grid level, so let's look at an example. If you were to build a 100 megawatt power plant, which is a small thing, Small power plant, okay, and if the sunlight is available only one fifth of the time of the day, then what that means is we need to store two gigawatt hours of 
electrical energy on a 24-hour cycle. So, so that's a very large amount of energy to be stored. Okay, and uh, so, like, uh, how how do we go about storing it, right? Okay, so let's look into it. So the question boils down to is how do we store a large amount of energy? Uh, and obviously, we are in gigajoules per cubic meter in a range which is much higher than things which are which we have considered so far, right? And avoid large volume of pressurized gas, of course, because, you know, as I said earlier, like, no, the volumes involved here are quite large, okay? So, so as a chemical engineer, for one of the things which we can certainly do is, uh, you know, is when the sunlight is available, right, we can take heat and electricity and from sun, okay, and uh, we could take water and make a hydrogen and oxygen, take that hydrogen, and then we can use a carbon dioxide and let's say we had stored the carbon dioxide in the night time, okay, and then, then we can take that carbon dioxide here, right here, we stored. We can take that carbon dioxide, vaporize it during the, day, uh, during the daytime, and that vaporized carbon dioxide could be reacted with the hydrogen to make carbon fuel of any of the hydrocarbon chemicals we want, and that chemical could be stored during the daytime when the sunlight is on, and then in the nighttime we'll use that, that fuel and convert it to, to to provide us the electricity, which is what is shown here, this big big black uh, black line, and we'll make water and carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide has to be separated from the exhaust, and will have to be liquefied and stored as liquid carbon dioxide. So what we see here is we store the liquid carbon dioxide in the nighttime, and in the daytime we take that liquid carbon dioxide, convert it to gaseous carbon dioxide, and then react it with the hydrogen, which comes from the sun, from sun. Okay, here I show wind and all those things, but but in the renewable energy, but most likely it will be sun, and we take that hydrogen and react with, uh, because carbon dioxide is almost a dead molecule. The only thing which is lower energy than that would be carbonates and so forth, but other than that, we do not have a lower energy level, so if you want to take carbon dioxide to the higher energy state, like, you know, we have to put hydrogen in, and uh, so we put that hydrogen and make the, make the hydrocarbons which are stored again during the daytime. So, so that's the cycle between the making of the hydrocarbons during the daytime when the sun is there and uh, using it in the nighttime to make carbon dioxide and then converting carbon dioxide, recovering carbon dioxide, making it liquid carbon dioxide and then storing that liquid carbon dioxide. So that's the, that's the cycle actually. So we go ahead, we look at the cycle, okay, and uh, so, so the question is when you draw it this way, it suddenly dawns on one point is that which hydrocarbon should we make, okay? So is, is the answer trivial in the sense that we should go and make a given hydrocarbon as a means to store. So what we did was, in order to answer that question, then after all, we are after production of electricity, which is work, which is exergy. So we asked ourselves, let's look at the hydrocarbon molecules, okay, so that uh, exergy is stored per carbon, okay. So the, so the carbons which will have a very high exergy storage presumably will have less recycle, right? Because if you're making a, a given quantity of electricity, then the carbon molecules, which store the highest quantity of exergy per carbon atom, then I have to store less quantity of carbon atoms, okay, as, as a hydrocarbon molecule, and uh, that would mean our recycle losses would be minimized and so forth. So there is a certain excitement to be able to use, you know, the, the, the molecules which have a high exergy content per carbon atom. And then a fraction of hydrogen exergy recovered in the fuel since we are taking CO2 and converting it to converting it to liquid fuel, we need to be a little bit careful that we don't use too much hydrogen to make that hydrocarbon molecules and in the sense that if a lot of hydrogen energy, so whenever we take CO2 and react with hydrogen to make a hydrocarbon molecule, some of the energy is released as as heat, right? So we have to be very careful that, that the heat release is not large because if it is, then, uh, then we are not storing as much uh, exergy from sun as we, sh we need to. And what that would mean is that we will have to make more hydrogen than we needed to. So, so this is an important entity. And the last one is energy density of the liquid fuel because once you have made this, this hydrocarbon molecules, we will be storing it. And if its energy density is low, then we will need a very large volume, right? So to so store a same amount of energy, like, you know, like what we were talking earlier, like you know, if you wanted to store like two gigawatt hour of energy, then uh, the exergy density has to be high as a liquid fuel. So when you're putting it in the tank, okay, like uh, you know, it doesn't occupy too much too much volume. So for example, if you're storing it as a gaseous 
get in a gaseous state and if your pressure was not high, the volume could be very large and uh, and that would not be acceptable. So let's look at all three exercise metrics. Okay, so if you look at, for example, the metric number one, which is the exergy stored per mole of carbon. So what we very quickly found out that methane has the highest exergy per carbon atoms. So methane can be very attractive if you can store methane. If you can make methane from CO2 and hydrogen and store methane, then we have to really to recover the same amount of energy. We have to, we will need less carbon molecules, and that means all the least carbon losses and so forth will 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 be there. Like will decrease those losses. Then uh, then let's look at the fraction of the hydrogen exergy used to make that hydrogen hydrocarbon molecule. So once you are making that molecule, what fraction of the hydrogen energy is being stored? And what we find out is that the that the molecules which are favorable here, okay, are such as as uh, as methanol is, for example, 98.3%, so that's a very good or diamethyl ether. So we did do, look into it, both of these molecules because uh, they certainly are storing a lot more energy. They're wasting the least amount of exergy contained in the hydrogen while making these molecules. Okay, so exergy density as a liquid, which is what comes out as a liquid, how much would you need for storage? So for example, if you were to make isooctane, its exergy density as a liquid is 27.4 gigajoules per cubic meter. So no wonder that our example, which we saw for the automobile, for the car, filling with uh, 10 gallons a minute and asking us how much energy is there, is like I saw octane, right? So it's 27.4, that means a lot of energy per unit volume. So that 10 gallons per minute we were filling in, there was a reason for for very high rate of fill of energy, exergy, like 10 megawatts or so forth. So, so it's important that we keep that in mind. So there are three, three metrics, and we have all identified three different hydrocarbon molecules. So there's a lot of trade-off. It's very clear at this point in time. There's a trade-off in the metrics, so, so we really can't go in and just pick one, one molecule and go. But in any event, we looked at all those molecules which we identified by this method, and what we find is that the, since methane is the highest content per, per, uh, per carbon atom, we use that as, uh, as, as, as a means, and uh, so what, but the only trouble with methane is it's the gaseous. So what we did was, as you can see here, like, you know, when uh, when we are using methane, when you're making methane and you're vaporizing liquid carbon dioxide to be converted to methane, okay, and stored, and so we decided to store the methane as liquid methane, and if you're storing liquid as liquid methane, what we do is we have come up with uh, refrigeration cycles, which takes the refrigeration from the vaporizing CO2 and transfers that refrigeration to methane, help to help making uh, so it's like pre-cooling with liquid CO2, and that's very good because that saves the uh, saves the amount of energy needed to liquefy methane and improves the process efficiency. Okay. In the next in the next step, when we in the night time when we are using methane, okay, and uh, and uh, and we are burning it, so we are vaporizing methane, and, uh, and and when we are burning methane, we are forming CO2. So there is a need to separate CO2 from the exhaust of the solid oxide fuel cell. We need to separate the CO2 and store CO2 as liquid CO2. So what we have done is 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 now we use the since liquid methane which was stored in the night time, like you know, sorry, li liquid methane which is stored in the daytime when the sun was there, needs to be vaporized, right? So it can provide the exergy or the electricity in the night. So as it is being vaporized in the night, what we do is we use its refrigeration for both separation and liquefaction of the exhaust gas from solid oxide fuel cell. That means that we use very little energy, extra extra energy or in the form of electricity or anything to purify the CO2. So almost all the purification and liquefaction energy of CO2 is met by the vaporization of LNG. And that's a very good news, okay, because because what happens by virtue of that, that what we find is that uh, that the penalty associated with the vaporization and condensation of methane is much reduced. Okay, and we can use we can so we can use refrigeration back and forth. Okay, and when we do that, what we find is the overall efficiency at these uh, these gigajoules per cubic meter level for methane is very high. Actually, is uh, it's close to 60% now, so, so that's very good. Okay, so what that is telling us is that uh, we can model and we can come up with the processes which can uh, which can take uh, you know liquid methane and through cryogenic. And so I'm not going through all the details because of the interest of time. There's a whole detailed flow sheets underneath these 
which are refrigeration cycles and which are heat exchanges and uh, and so forth. But I have I've just just uh, glossed over them. But uh, but uh, but there is a lot of detailed modeling underneath. And uh, and when you do all that, what you find is that the uh, the methane is just simply you know you could use as liquid liquid uh, liquid methane during the the daytime. In the nighttime, you use it and then you store liquid CO2. And uh, what you get efficiencies are in, are close to 60 percent. So that's very fascinating. So you could get really high efficiencies of storage. And uh, and the student who who has done that, his name is Isa, and um, and Isa comes to us from Qatar. And Qatar, as you all know, is very big in LNG. So so his skill sets of uh, working on the LNG plant was very handy here because after all. The methane, which is being liquefied as liquid methane in the daytime, uses a lot of that knowledge of uh, of making LNG from a natural gas plant. Okay, so that's the so and but the trick was how to reduce the penalty of storing methane and vaporizing methane, and so it's fairly high. So we have been able to almost double the efficiency of what it would have been if uh, if you were to store liquid hydrogen sometimes. And the similar efficiencies are possible with methanol, by the way. Okay, the trick here with methanol is that you don't purify methanol. So when you form methanol, you store store 50% methanol, 50% water mixture. So because if you were to purify methanol, the efficiencies will plummet. Okay, and then use the what the methanol water mixture. You know, in in the nighttime, your volume storage goes up, but nevertheless, you are ahead in the game, and you can get 52 to 54% efficiency. So going forward. When you're talking about gigawatt hour levels, the, the we are chemical engineers, and it could provide us the opportunity to use chemicals, chemical reactions, the heat of the reactions to store large quantities of heat of energy. Because compared to sensible energy, or compared to latent heat, and so forth, the reaction, the chemical reaction, the oxidation reaction heat is can be very high per molecule, and 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 that may be the way to that would be the way to store the energy. That was the, the that's the that's the conclusion from these set of slides. Okay, and uh, so so what I will do is now I will switch gears. So so in the, so far we talked about uh, how to look at biomass, how to treat the carbon efficiently. We learned that carbon was efficient, and but if you wanted to recover most of the carbon, we would need hydrogen. Then what are the efficient processes to make hydrogen? We learned about that. Then we addressed the question of intermittency. Now let's. Address the issue of, uh, like you know, if you're in a solar economy, as I said, the energy is uh, we'll have to use energy very efficiently because uh, because the harnessing energy is is not just simply having having a like you know what I told uh, told you earlier, like you know, dig a hole and find a find the gallons of uh, gallons and gallons and gallons of oil, and a 10 gallon of oil has a lot of energy. It's not going to be happening actually, and uh, and we will we have we will have to learn. How to use energy efficiently, and as chemical engineers, one of the main things where we have to learn to use energy efficiently is is, is separations. And uh, what I will do now is give you some of the examples which uh, we have been doing in terms of multi-component distillation. And um, and uh, hopefully by the time I'm done, like you know, you realize that even though it is a traditional energy of a traditional area of chemical engineering, but nevertheless still very vibrant and and will continue to play a very vital role. Going forward, whether solar or fossil economy, so separation research is important because uh, you know 40 to 70 percent of the operating and capital cost on any typical chemical plant, or or a, or a the bio refinery of the future, where we'll be, where we'll be doing what uh, some of the things we'll be doing is what I have talked about so far. You know, you will have certainly have if you're making chemicals, you will sit and different fractions of. Uh, of fuels, you will certainly still need distillation and uh, and different membranes and whatever have you, different different separation techniques. And this slide is basically telling you that uh, as of today, you know, if you look at it in the fossil fuel economy, there are like 40,000 plus distillation columns. Okay, and uh, and this is from Humphreys, uh, Jimmy Humphreys' uh, publications. Okay, and we have all that. And then uh, so if you were to to make distillation, multi-component distillation, more efficient, okay, a 20 to 50 percent efficiency, okay, energy could save quite a bit. Like you know, you're talking about 85 to 250, 20 million barrels of oil equivalent per year. So that's a lot of money per year to be saved if you could make the distillation processes, you know, efficient in 20 to 50 percent range, okay. And these energy savings are comparable, obviously, if you reach to this kind of an of savings to finding new giant, giant oil fields and so forth. So there's certainly an incentive. 
to make distillation processes more efficient. So let me just show you some of the things things we have done at Purdue on on this front. Okay, and some of my graduate students who have done this work, like Vishesh and Arun and uh, Vishesh Shah, Arun Girdar and uh, and Gautam and Josh. So I will just describe you some of their work. So here our aim is that if you give us an application, we should be able to tell you systematically do a proper search and identify a separation step system, which in this case happens to be a multi-component distillation system, because in the long run it is a separation system, which is what we are trying to, to at least I'm trying to do, but I have to go slow one step at a time, so the first step is, is the multi-component distillation, and which is cost effective and energy efficient. So why do you want to do that? So here I'm just trying to tell you, is so, so like, you know, when you are doing it, like, you know, for, if you look at the four component distillation, which is what uh, I'm, I'm showing here, and uh, every column has just one revolver and one condenser, right, and four components, and and all of these have three columns, but you can see there are many ways you can uh, assemble the three columns to separate a four component mixture such as A, B, C, D, okay? So like the, on the top left is the configuration, which is a direct configuration, right? We separate A for the first column, B from the second column, C from the last column, and so forth. And, and the reverse of that is if you go to the bottom right totally of these configurations, here we separate all A, B, C, D from the last column. We, we wait till the last, and uh, everything is just fractionated one by one by one, and we cascade. So, but, but there are 18 possible ways you could arrange it, which is what uh, I have shown here. And, um, and if you will offer a thermal coupling between these columns, there are 134 more of these. So the question is, so when I came to Purdue, one of the big questions in my mind was, could we come up with a method which will el el elucidate all these possible configurations? So if you gave me a number of components, I should be able to tell you exactly how many of these are out there. And I'm happy to tell you that we did publish this paper and uh, in AICC Journal, and uh, it tells our method there. It's a very simple six-step method, and uh, for any given components, you could draw all possible configurations, okay? So for example, for five components, you have 203 configurations without thermal coupling, and by the time you allow thermal coupling, you, you got a 5,925 configurations, and what that means is that you got 6,128 total configurations, distillation configurations. Four and five, and five component separation is fairly common, four and five, in any chemical plant or a petroleum refinery or any biorefinery, okay? And if you go to six, of course, the number goes to a half a million with thermal coupling, and by seven, it is totally astronomical. And, uh, and, and, and if any one of you is like me, I just, I do not know how to draw all these uh, by hidden trial method, okay? So when I was a practitioner working in industry, you know, when I used to draw these by random guess heuristics and so forth, okay, but, uh, but whenever you do that, chances of coming up with the most optimal configuration is, isn't there, okay. So that was the first step. So Vishesh Shah's thesis, uh, his work solved this problem. So we could draw these configurations, okay, by a simple route. But the problem is that if you give me a five components and if there are 6,128 configurations, how do I go and find, right? We still have to identify the best ones. It's not a trivial problem, by the way. So. It was so one step at a time. So the first step was how do we know how, what is out there? And now that we know our search space, the next problem is to how to find the most, uh, you know, whatever our objective function is, whether it is energy, cost, or whatever have you. How do I go and look at these 6,128 uh, plausible configurations and find the right solution, right? So what we have done is like uh, we have done an NLP formulation, okay, nonlinear programming, whereby so what this program does is for every configuration we create using uh, you know a matrix representation we create then what we do is uh, for every configuration we create a columns and for every column section we write equations for mass balance equations we write the underwoods equation so so so, under, so we don't use a commercial software right now we use our own uh, using Underwood's method because uh, that's the only way that we can do very quick screening. And we have also confirmed that our results from the Underwood's method are very well in agreement with the detailed calculation using uh, using a, a, a process modeling such as Aspen, okay? And so we use Underwood's to calculate the vapor duties, so that's the heat duties in the column. And then there are our inter-column inter variable re relations equations, and then we have optimization improvement conditions, which 
make the optimization converge, and then we have our objective function. For example, this one shows the objective function, minimize the heat duty. So what we do is for every configuration we create, we generate all these equations and constraints, and then they are solved under Baron, looking for the global optimality, okay, by branch and bound search methods, and then we find our solution. And we have succeeded, okay? So I'm very glad to tell you folks that for all 6,128 configurations for uh, for a five component of, and please note that these are not agiotropic, they're non-agiotropic at this point in time. We can go ahead and we can do the calculations and uh, and uh, and we can rank list them. So, so if you're doing for heat duty, for example, here, we can rank list them from all from one through 6,128. And we have a user interface which shows all of these configurations, you know, like, you know, as all with the column configurations, you can hover your tool on that, you can see the vapor duties, you can see the column that, you know, what would be the vapor duties and what is being transferred of the composition strain. So what we have done is we have run these. It takes around 18 hours of CPU time to rank list all of these. And it took us a year and a half to come up when, it, when these configurations would converge. And now we are at a point where it, they do. And uh, so, so once we have rank listed it, what we have done is we have taken the, in one of the examples of ethylene, we took the top 10 and we ran a detailed model using, using Aspen to see the rank listing of those 10, if they are more or less the same as we came up through, through our, this past simulation, and guess what, the top five were still the top five in the same order as we had estimated, we had found from this. Sixth and seventh had interchanged their position, but the rest were again the same. So, so that tells us that uh, the robustness of the method, and we can quickly identify. Now, we have just implemented the cost in it, so we can do it with the cost also. So. So it, uh, and then what we did was like uh, at one of the chemical companies, like major chemical company, the, the guy student who did this, Anirudh, he went there and uh, applied our, our system to three of their applications and uh, in all cases he found savings in the excess of 20% and mind you these processes were in existence for, fairly, for, for a fair amount of time and they had gone through a lot of uh, the usual which is we all do, the experience of optimization in heuris by using heuristics. And the advantage of this is it doesn't use heuristics, it goes through the whole search space and tells you what are the right answers, okay? So, so that's what it is. And so we applied it, for example, to petroleum crude distillation as an example, okay? And the conventional scheme is shown on the left here, okay? And uh, when we go ahead and we simulate all this, what happens is we find hun literally hundreds and hundreds of configurations which are more efficient than this, okay, and which are shown on the right side. I've shown only two of them, and the one on the where my cursor is hovering, okay, is, is anywhere from 10 to 15% more efficient for the light or the heavy crude than what is shown on the left. And of course, if you leave the problem totally loose, like you can get configurations which are as high as, uh, you know, like, you know, somewhere between 20 to close to 50% efficient. So that's interesting, there are hundreds of them, and of course the next challenge is that once you have identified these configurations, as we all know, we need to look for the heat integration on the refinery, how are they going to be heat integrating, because that's where the true benefit will come from. But nevertheless, it gives us those configurations, and the, the good part is that uh, at least someone like myself has a great deal of difficulty, for example, the one on the top right, drawing it on my own imagination, but now they're in front of us and we can decide whether we like it or not, whether they're operable or not, or whether they can be manufactured or not, or what would the control structure be, and so, so it gives us a, it only opens up a box for us actually, and being able to rank list and play with that, and, and having the global optimality guaranteed because of the, of the use of Baron and having the right equations is very enticing actually. Okay, so while we're doing all this, like you, of course, just as usual, we found a lot of new things. So, so what I'm showing here, just I'm just going to share one of the quick things with you, which I'm very, very excited about right now, which is shown on the left. Okay, what you see here is the, the basic configurations, like you know, using four columns. But the key things is here, when you have a situation like this, where BC and CD exist from a, a transfer from one of the reballers and one of the condensers, you could eliminate reballer condenser, make them a mass exchange mass and heat exchange section of a distillation column, and you can let uh, you know the vapor from the bottom column go up for the distillation, the liquid reflux on the top go to the bottom, and you can make an B and C, and guess what? This further leads to a lot of heat savings, okay? And one good thing is, which is not shown on this slide, I just realized, is that when you're pulling B, C, and C, D, you could pull, pull it from the middle of this column, you could pull another C stream, okay, which further will reduce your heat duty. 
So, so there are a lot of new things which are happening. So the, all the old configurations which we have been, which I just talked to you about basic configurations, but now there's a whole array of new configurations which are heat and mass integrated, and they use less columns and they can save you more. So it's the five components distillation, which is what I'm showing here. Five components being done in three columns and uh, as against four and, and a very efficient system which can produce all five components fairly pure. So, so it's all possible and uh, we just just got this paper out and uh, in the ICT journal and, uh, but it does open up a whole new box for us suddenly and uh, so, so for me at least it is very exciting because at least I can now keep a graduate student busy for, for the next four or five years, so. And um, so, so I would like to just sum up here by saying that multi-component distillation research is still very vibrant and fun, like, you know, so to think that it is traditional and it is not much to be gained there and so forth, I think we have just begun, okay? And uh, the good part is it will also be relevant to the solar economy, the picture which I'm trying to paint, and that's the thrust of my all my research at Purdue, okay? And uh, so to, to sum up all this process synthesis work, which, uh, which is what uh, was my charter for today, okay? I think solar economy requires energy, energy and carbon efficient solutions, and I would like to, to re-emphasize the efficiency part. Okay, so we talked about fuels and chemicals, and we talked about preserving the, the biomass carbon, okay, and uh, and uh, and using heat mass and and electricity from directly from sun and producing processes with those integrations which we have not done in the past. At the same time, how to account for the intermittency. So, so it's, it's a pretty challenging problem, okay? Then the, in any solar economy, if you're going to be using the renewable carbon, then we will need hydrogen. And the question is, what are the good ways of making hydrogen? And from a process point of view, what processes should we be looking at? And uh, then how would we be storing it? And again, closed carbon cycles are very important, I think, okay? And so something like traditional areas, like multi-component distillation is absolutely, absolutely vibrant, okay? And the energy modeling it is a very multi-dimensional problem here, okay? So it is not, so, as you see, a lot of interactions, a lot of relationship back and forth between different processes, different uses. So you use electricity for driving and you use electricity to make hydrogen. Then you convert the CO2 to fuel. So you use, again, that fuel for driving. So there's a lot of interconnections and how do we optimize? So, so it's, it's a fun problem. It's a good time, good time, okay? And uh, so before I go to acknowledgement, I would just like to take one more minute just to tell you folks that from what I have, the way I have used energy systems modeling in my own work is I have used it to, gu is to guide my, my experimental part of the research actually. And uh, so based on all these observations, you know, like, you know, I have a robust group which really makes solar cells because if you saw from all these, Sun to electricity is very important, okay, and it will play bigger and bigger roles. So I have a bunch of graduate students who make nanocrystal inks, and so make nanocrystals, they make ink, they print it and on a substrate, and then we, we make the devices. So we make real solar cell actually, and of copper, indium, gallium, diselenide, and copper, zinc, tin sulfide. And uh, as of today, like copper, indium, gallium, gallium diselenide solar cells have 15% efficiencies which is actually for the solution-based method is the second highest in the world, actually. And for copper zinc tin sulfide, we have solar cells which are 9.4% efficient again, and then again, that's the second highest efficiency by any method in the world, actually. So I use this modeling to guide my research, and based on this, we also learned that uh, I was showing you the process of fast hydropyrolysis and Fischer-Tropsch gasifier interaction for carbon recovery, and based on that, we have built reactors to run fast hydropyrolysis of the biomass, with, followed by hydro deoxygenation. And there I'm collaborating with my colleagues, Fabio Ribeiro and Nick Delgas. So we have real reactors. We have, we have successfully been demonstrating fast hydropyrolysis and hydro deoxygenation to make liquid fuel. And this summer we did make liquid fuel with very low oxygen content. We did find the catalyst. So there are some progress on that front. So, so, so while I do a lot of uh, systems modeling, I enjoy doing it, but I also use it to guide and identify where should some of the other research be directed, and I just wanted to share that with you. And on the acknowledgement side, of course, like I'm very thankful to to Department of Energy and NSF uh, for funding almost all my research, actually. They are the ones who are really driving it. Okay. And my collaborators, as I was told you earlier, for, for on the modeling side, like, you know, is basically Professor Mohit Tower Malani, like, you know, he's, uh, he's in the School of Trinity, he's in business school, but he's an optimization guru, and uh, 
and uh, and it works out very well with him. And biomass and liquid fuel, which is what I was describing earlier, I have a number of colleagues on campus with whom I collaborate. Okay. And here's my research team. I had to put it up so all my graduate students who do all the work, and I'm just presenting it. Okay. And uh, well, what can I say? Like this is a great time to be a chemical engineer. I hope. I pass some of that enthusiasm to all of you, and uh, because uh, I really do believe that this is a perfect time to to be a chemical engineering and doing the research, actually. And uh, with that, I would like to thank all, all of you because I know it's a long time; it's one hour, 25 minutes, and just I know it has been a monologue, and um, you know. But nevertheless, I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed you enjoyed the talk, and thanks thanks for doing so. Bye.